Okay, today I am carving another small sauce ladle. I'm just dropping here. Notice how slow I'm going with this dropping. Um, your edge is so refined at this point that if you were going too fast and got sloppy with your technique, you could really trash your edge quick. So go slow and do a good job. All right, one big kick I've been on lately has been putting your strop back into a case. Even if that just means wrapping it up, make sure it's not just floating around. So I can get the light a little bit better. All right, so I'm gonna do another one of these um, grackle sauce ladles that I did a couple weeks back, maybe a month ago. That one, was the handle was completely lined up with the grain and then the bowl was completely at 90 degrees. I felt like it was a little too much at 90 degrees. So this time around, I thought I would see uh, what I could get if I angled down into the grain. Now, I didn't want to angle in the grain too steeply, um, but because it's radially split, because you have the grain running through the handle this way, I can angle it pretty steeply through this way. So. What I did was, you can see this was the um, the top of the bit. So the bowl is angled quite steeply, um, and the handle is angled less steeply within the grain. If, if this represents the the original plane of the wood grain, and I had to stop. I would have gone steeper, except I ran out of depth in the piece of wood I was using. So. Um, I ended up with slightly less crank than I wanted. There is still some thickness here, so I'll be able to exaggerate that crank a little bit. What I was hoping for is I didn't like exactly how 90 degrees it was. I wanted it to be just slightly off, but I don't think I'm gonna be able to quite get there with this. At any rate, the first step, as always, is just trimming around your outline so that you can then, um, so that you can then start working on the, the top face. And interestingly, you know, one of the hard things about the last time I did this was that the way it was angled in the log, it just made a lot of these things more difficult. So because this is a little more like how I conventionally do spoons, just a little more exaggerated, I suspect things are gonna be a little easier and better behaved. But one of the things I'm seeing here is just that the, uh, this is so purely end grain here that I have to be a little gentle with how fiercely I'm carving it so I don't crush the grain. I want to be cutting it, not crushing it. That's one of the things, if you end up crushing the end grain, you end up getting this little grain tear out right at the rim. Um, so, again, this is a new shape for me. This is only the second time I've ever carve this shape. Um, but if you guys have any questions about anything, it doesn't have to be what I'm carving. Um, it could just be about anything you're struggling with with carving or things you see me do that are unclear why I do them or what some of the nuances are, please ask questions because it's better than just me saying what I feel like saying. <laughs> All right, notice how I'm using the tip of the knife here so that my thumb is actually offset. And um, here, I'm gonna tilt this whole thing down a little more. So you guys can really see what I'm doing here. It means you won't be able to see my face, but you can handle that. So notice how my thumb is offset over here, but I'm using the tip of the knife between my hand and my thumb. This is one thing I see beginners take a moment to figure out is that you can't have your thumb behind the point. You have no power this way. Your thumb has to be offset. And then this hand is, all it's doing is steering the knife. All the power is coming from squeezing with these fingers. All right, I also am a big believer in using pencil lines to keep myself on target here. So there. There. 
Now, part of the idea of this design is that I can get away with a steeper crank because I'm keeping the handle quite wide. So I need to make sure that I maintain that handle width and I want it to taper evenly. So. Um, and because it tapers this way, I'm going to be carving, instead of carving down to the shoulder from the tip of the handle in the way you do with a handle flares the other way, in this instance, everything is going away from the bowl because of the way the handle tapers, which is actually quite refreshing. Okay. Now you'll notice I didn't try to, um, you know, refine this line the, the whole, well, I guess, I guess here I am refining it. I'm not trying to get a perfect form at this stage. Um, spoon carving is about refining and refining and refining with each stage. And if you try to get things perfect at too early a stage, sometimes you end up cutting off more than you really really then really would have been good and you end up stuck with not enough material because you tried to make it perfect right at the beginning without anticipating that you're going to have to continue making cuts later on you didn't give yourself anything to remove without digging into stuff you wanted to keep so with these guys i feel like it's nice if they have a little hmm Flip at the end. I can't make it as strong as you could, like with a metal one, where it actually helps it hang off the edge of a surface. But so now, as you can see, I've transitioned to doing the top surface, which um, I've already smoothed this with a draw knife in the spoon mule. So um, I'm not looking to do much more than that. How deep in I go in here will determine will be determined by what I end up doing with the rim. So now the weak link is this bit of section of the rim where uh, the grain caught and tore a little bit. So I need to resolve that before I figure out how much crank I can build into the spoon. So one nice thing about orienting the spoon like this in the log is that it just makes these cuts much more familiar or what I need to do is already built in. It's just a matter of degree. It's, you know, it's, it's more extreme. So a little more delicate, like I need to be treading carefully, but, um, which direction things should be cut and all that is very familiar. All right. So now the way I get more crank into this is by redefining this top rim to be more diving down in on this part of things here so um, to some extent i need to make sure i can do it equally on both sides right so there's no point in but i have plenty of material so good i'm actually going to draw what i think i can do hey dan um and that will keep me on target as well. You'll notice that I like drawing what it is I think I'm going to do. Okay, good. And I can see on the back here, by looking at it from the back, whether my lines on the back are equal. Because otherwise, when you just look at it from the side, you'd say, well, is this line I drew the same as the line on the other side? You can get a pretty good sense from looking at it from the back, whether it is or not. All right, that gives me way more crank than I thought I was going to get, actually. So, all right, so now it's just a matter of pulling this down to that line. So um, today's Wooden Spoon Geek Out podcast, 
Um, for those of you who don't know, I have a podcast called Emmett Audio. You can find it anywhere you get your podcasts. And every other day I do what I call Wooden Spoon Geek Out, where I talk exclusively about some detail about spoon carving um, that people have told me that they're struggling with. And today I was talking about consistency, and it just occurred to me, one of the things, I talked about the importance of being able to draw the shape you want, but one thing I didn't talk about is the importance of using a pencil as you're carving to keep yourself on target and to allow you to um, end up with a consistent result. But that's really important, actually, as it turns out. I should... Um, sure to mention that next episode so the idea with these ladles is not that they're going to be like soup ladles for that I have a much larger ladle that uses an oval shape to get me the extra size but these are instead designed to like use to serve salad dressing from a mason jar that sort of thing so they need to be narrow enough to fit into a wide mouth mason jar and then deep enough to hold you know a meaningful amount of liquid All right. notice that I'm not messing with any of the stuff in the middle of the bowl that will come out when I start using the hook knife I might take it out sooner um, if I think that it would help me alright good one thing I will do is dress this a little bit here. Okay, it's not exactly the shape that I want at this stage, but it's too early right now to mess with that. So right now I'm just trying to get underneath all of the axe marks so that I know what I'm working with, what I have available to me in terms of shape before I go nuts. Because let's say I went and, let's say I found a crack on the back that made this so that it would have to be less deep. Well, then I might want to maximize every ounce of size I got, whereas if I can make it quite deep well then I might go for more of a true circle um, and lose some of that width there but I want to keep my options open until I get underneath all of these axe marks on the back and I know exactly how deep they go and I've sort of gotten underneath all of them essentially so I've carved them away hey Greg So getting this sort of thing even is, is kind of a matter of just being aware of where your next cut is going to come, even as you're doing the current cut so that you can move fluidly from one to the next. But you're basically just hitting high spots again and again. You know, you make a cut, you find the next high spot, you move on to the next cut. Get the back shoulders. And the other thing that I'm trying to do is make this rim nice and narrow so that when I go to carve around it, I can get a nice, um, even, smooth cut. Okay, good. So now I've got the back. Roughly evened out. It's not perfect. This is cherry wood. Yep. Um, 
Now I take the pencil again, and now looking at it from here, I'm gonna figure out what is the largest round shape that I can get. And um, actually, one thing I might do is stay back from the edge a little bit and do what I'm assuming is gonna be the center of the bowl rather than try and define the outside rim. And that has the advantage of allowing me to draw the part across the neck here. Uh, this is the second iteration of my end grain ladle. Uh, yes, yep. So, uh, correct. So one of the things I struggled with with that end grain ladle, Greg, was um, the way it was oriented in the grain made for a very strong neck, but honestly, it was kind of overkill how strong the neck was, and the orientation made it difficult, made a bunch of cuts difficult that didn't need to be difficult. So I'm trying to see if I can achieve a similar effect close enough to it to, to work well for its intended purpose of being like a, you know, a sauce ladle, something where you'd be dipping into a, you know, a, a ball jar of salad dressing or something. Um, or a bowl, so it doesn't. It needs to have a certain amount of crank, but it doesn't need to be 90 degrees. Um, how much planning goes into my starting cuts when you're just beginning a spoon from the blank stage? How much is getting after it and getting the stock moving, making your form? You think too much about the end. So that's where the that's honestly, Jerry. That's where the pencil lines come in. Um, if I have, if I can trust my pencil lines, right? They don't have to be the finished form, but it's my original pencil marks that I was carving to. Um, so now I'm gonna go and I'm, now that I have the inside rim, roughly the way I like it, so now I'm gonna draw the outside rim that I'm actually gonna carve to. Um, so if I have the, the rough form the way I like it, then I'll just carve to that rough form. And you can see how here at the sort of halfway mark, I have the chance to assess and shift and and figure out what the final form is going to be based on sort of the reality on the ground. Um, so yeah, and and I don't know if you watched that other video, Jerry, but there were there were some changes that happened partway through, where I sort of took advantage of opportunities that the that the situation, the piece of wood that had created for me. Um, so that can also happen. Um, and that, that can be really nice. So now, because there's so much material here that needs to be removed before I can really see what's going on, I'm going to take the hook knife and sort of rough that out a little bit. Um, and that way I'll be able to define the top of the rim a little bit better. So let's see, I'm going to shift this around so you can see more what I'm doing. So one of the problems with that original ladle was that it was so directly across the end grain that it was just a real pain in the neck to carve because there's nothing harder, even with a hook knife, than carving right across end grain. So um, that was one of the tricky things was that, yeah. Um, was that the... Um, the hollowing was extremely hard. And you can see the hollowing here is not particularly hard. So trying to avoid cutting straight across end grain is, is a good idea. Um, and what I'll be curious to see is can I get, I won't be able to get this handle quite as thin as I was the other one, but can I get it thin enough that it sort of achieves enough sense of delicacy that I feel like it's a good compromise. Um, and then This is kind of an unusual cut for me. I'm bracing it with this finger here because it's an awkward position. Because I can't pull against my thumb, there's not enough oppositional support, I'm using this finger to help push as well. So I'm sort of getting half my power from the pull and half my power from the, from the push. Now remember, the goal is not to carve the whole bowl at this stage, it's just to get um, sort of the, the material down below this inner rim line that I've drawn here so that I can then trim around the rim, carve the top of the rim, 
without having that big mound of wood in the middle that still needed to be re removed. So, there we go. Get across the front face here. So you can see the benefits of not trying to line up the bowl completely with the end grain. If it's tilted even slightly like this, it makes a tremendous difference in how easy it is to carve. Whew. Um, yeah, that's right. I'm remembering that this sort of off shoulder was the trickiest thing to carve. So I know you guys can't see it when it tilts over like this, but maybe it gives you a sense of you know, how much sometimes you're holding the bowl so that it's upright and then you're getting into it like this. Um, Alright, almost ready to switch back. Okay, good. So now you can see from the side that I've removed that material. Everything is down below the rim. Let's shift this back over here. And this should go. So now I'm going to carve to the outline, the pencil outline. Um, and again, this is where having a pencil outline really helps me stay on target. If I didn't have that pencil outline, I would have a much more difficult time remembering the line that I wanted to achieve as I was cutting it. How do I manage chatter in the bottom of the bowl? It's just a matter of sharpness. Um, so yes, uh, and also for a given bowl depth, you can handle a certain diameter bowl for a given depth, and it has to do with the curvature of your knife. So if your knife has a steeper curve, it can do a deeper bowl without getting that point of having chatter. So um, what I do is I sort of, at this point, I have a rough sense of how deep that is, and I try to approach my finished bowl depth, what I think I can hit without getting too much chatter, before I bring the rim all the way out to the final sort of inner rim distance. And that way when it starts to chatter, I can then pull the rim out just slightly, thus making the diameter just slightly wider. And that will allow me to deal with the areas that are chattering without having it chattering. And then I need to sort of finish up and, and walk away and be done before I go too much deeper because then I'll hit the same problem again, but I won't have that buffer of the extra rim thickness to help me this time. So that's how I deal with chatter. But yeah, it's largely, I mean, if your knife is sharp, the sharper your knife is, the more it will help with that. Um, um, ooh, and here's a little challenge for myself. So one of the things I wanted to do um, yeah, you try to go too deep for your bowl sizes. Yep, exactly. There's a there's a limit to how deep it can go um, without it being a problem. Okay, so here, interesting. Here is my initial sketch. Where is it? Of the small ladle that I originally thought to do, and then here is at the very end of this notebook here. Um, uh, where is it? No, wait, I must have passed it. Stand by. Wait, or is it in here? I think it might be in my pocket notebook. Notice that I'm not putting down this sloyd knife. If I was going to put it down, I'd put a sheath on it. Um, so there's something I've been wanting to try, which is why I'm doing this ladle right now, which is doing this, having a very slight lip on the bowl of the ladle. So that's, I need to make sure I leave enough material to then create that lip. Does that make sense? 
Um, the other interesting thing to notice here is how much these shoulders need to be brought in so that I achieve that sort of tight look that I'm going for. Okay, so now that I have carved around to the outside, now I'm going to take my pencil and I'm going to draw the change that I want to have that be nice and tight there. So you can see how it's the, really the, the pencil helping me achieve the design that I drew in the first place. I think if you don't use a pencil, you end up in places. Sometimes you might end up in a place that's cool. But a lot of times you just end up in a place where you sort of boxed yourself into a corner and couldn't achieve what you wanted to achieve. So you can see how to get the look that I wanted, I need to remove that material there. It's really easy to leave this material on the shoulders, and it's an important step of learning to figure out that you're leaving it there and figure out how to remove it in a way that gives you the look you're looking for. You also notice how I'm not really messing with the handle at all. I'll get to the handle once I've gotten the bowl completely squared away, but if I kept going back and carving the handle every time this got messy, I would end up with way too thin of a handle. Um, it wouldn't be a deliberate choice how the handle ended up, and I need it to be a deliberate choice. Okay. Hey, is anyone watching right now going to be at the Spoonosaurus gathering at Matt's house next weekend? So now you can see that pulling that in has created this really wide bit here. So now I am going to do two things. I'm going to redefine where that inner rim is because it needs to be, you can see how it's sort of too far in. So now I need to push it out a little bit and say, okay, the rim is going to, actually come around to there. It's going to come around to there. Okay, good, good. Okay. So now Remove this material up to there. Okay, good. Now, bring that down. And good. So now, you see how I've pulled everything in. I've made it look the way I want it to look from there. So now, I'm going to recarve the top of this rim and make it have the, the true slope that I want it to have. And this is also my moment to really help define that crank. Continue exaggerating it. Good. And I'm going to have this top rim basically blend right into the side so you can see how that top rim sort of swirls around and ends up in the side there 
Um, and you can also see how there's sort of a height of material here that's going to be removed a little bit later. But what I'm looking at is this rim right there, whether it has the slope that I want it to have, which it does. So now, Other side. Okay, so now you can see that I've basically got it nicely evened up the way I want it like this. For some reason you just noticed how much pencil work went into carving. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, I think I am, I mean, I'm probably not unique in that, but I, I am certainly unique in showing it. I think a lot of spoon carvers putting out videos are putting out videos of them carving without using a pencil. So it might be that I really am the only one doing a lot of it, but I think there's also a certain mystique that people are presenting themselves carving things that they know very well how to carve and they're not shooting for consistency necessarily they're just shooting for nice form and so um, and so they're not showing themselves using a pencil even if they do use a pencil sometimes particularly when they're figuring out new shapes because um, I think the pencil is good for for two things right it's good for helping you be consistent and it's good for helping you figure out a form that is new to you. Okay, so now I think it's time to address the back of the handle. I don't want to do too much in the bowl um, yet. I want to pull in the thickness of the back of the handle and I'm going to be paying attention to how it feels, flexing it occasionally. So I don't want to go to the point where it feels too delicate, but I suspect that we can go probably half this thickness and still have it feel completely fine. Notice how my thumb, instead of my thumb being here, it's actually like this for this part. Um, and that really helps me with these sort of powerful planing cuts. I'm trying to I'm not trying to get across the entire width, but I'm trying to make big planing cuts. Um, let's see. How does that want to be carved? It's a little unclear which direction this little flip wants to be carved. both. This little detail is kind of a pain in the neck um, because it's difficult to do it but it also is going to make it so nice to hold like that. Hey, <laughs> thanks so much Rita. Um, Okay, sometimes it can be helpful to see if you've got a straight line if you look down it like this. Um, 
So. Now, when you're approaching something like this tail flip that you don't want to just slam into with your knife, you got to kind of do it in uh, hand squeezes here because anything else is too uncontrolled. Okay, that's starting to flex, so we're not going to go much narrower than that. So it's worth pointing out that you probably wouldn't want to do a handle this narrow if it was narrow in this dimension also. So part of the reason why I can get away with this is because, um, because the handle, I deliberately kept the handle wide. All right, so here's one nice trick. When you're trying to get a thickness like this to look even and you want it to basically be a, a rectangle if you focus on one side and get it looking exactly the line that you want and then focus on the other side and get it looking exactly like what you want and then you sort of blend the stuff in the middle your eye is drawn to the edge. It's drawn to the that nice crisp edge that you've created, and it kind of glosses over all this sort of slight unevenness in the middle. And you can see that your that's what your eye is drawn to is that line on the edge. And it doesn't really see whether this is truly flat or not. Um, so, particularly in situations like this where you're trying to get something to look almost geometrically even, it's important to focus on what your eye sees rather than the reality of something. You see that looks much nicer now because I'm going to be eliminating these little bumps here. So. And by doing, by not trying to do the whole handle width, I am essentially enabling myself to get a much longer cut, much, much longer. Good. Good. Just more. It's also a good way to make it look more delicate while still actually maintaining a little more thickness in the middle, which helps keep it nice and strong. Good. Good. It's interesting. I actually want a slight amount of flex because a slight amount of flex is going to make the person using it use it with the right degree of delicacy. It's going to feel different in their hands. And they're going to treat it differently. Um, so, okay, good, good. So, again, I'm going to give it the appearance of delicacy by pulling in that corner, but actually leave the center slightly thicker. You can see it right there. And that, well, that's what you're seeing there is the bump, but you can see, uh, there's no good way to show you. You can see how the center is sort of has a slight swell to it. And that gives you the appearance of delicacy 
and a nice crisp straight line, uh, particularly nice curl A, eh? um, while at the same time maintaining some strength in the center. So this is actually a great uh, thing. I don't know, Jerry, are you still watching? Um, because Jerry asked, you know, how much do I know what I'm shooting for right at the beginning? Like, I didn't know that I was going to do a handle like this that has slight swell in the middle. This is something I'm sort of figuring out as I'm realizing that because of the, because of the imperative to keep this a little on the thicker side, but I want it to look really delicate. So I'm basically making up this process of making it look delicate on the side as I go along here. So it's a great example of how you don't need to have it figured out right at the beginning. You need to sort of have your general idea figured out, but the rest of it, not so much. Right, let's see how this feels now. Um, it's feeling pretty good. This needs to be tapered the same way. Notice how I'm using the very tip of the blade for this. Just the very tip. Okay. Good. Now I can see that I need to do a little bit of refining of the lines as you see them from the side. I'm sorry, from the from the plan view. I need to refine these lines on the side a little bit. It's funny, they're um, a slight, slight straight tapers are fairly easy to do, but the more precise and minimal a form you're, you shoot for, the trickier and trickier it becomes. <laughs> so something like this where I'm trying to get it to taper evenly, and also handle length also makes things difficult, so if you're trying to do a longer handle, getting a nice even taper on a handle that's this long is much harder than an even taper on like a scoop handle, for instance. So. Good. Good. Okay, so now I've got a nice end there. That's starting to come together. Okay, good. So 
the one thing that you end up getting with this style handle is that um, the bowl is going to dig into the handle just slightly and it's going to form essentially a sort of scallop across the back of the handle here. So I don't want to make this too thin because then that that scallop is going to bust right through to the to the back. So um, at this stage, let me think about what's the next right move. Um, okay, again, I'm just finding the lines that you're going to see as they appear on the edge. Okay. Now, the one thing I can see is that it still looks a little bit lopsided. It still looks like a shade more material over here than over here. So, and that probably is just because the handle shifted slightly. So we're going to address that. Um, how are we going to address that? Let's see here. So now I'm basically just going and using a pencil to draw the areas where I think I should remove a little bit of material. Am I going to redraw the entire thing? Maybe. Maybe that's what I'm doing. Um, being able to see sort of how much you need to remove in order to pull something into symmetry is, is a skill in its own right, and it's quite tricky. Um, and the best advice I can give you is just to kind of squint your eyes, because if you squint your eyes, it helps you pay attention to certain things and ignore other things. So I think if I remove particularly this strong bit right here, that will help tremendously in how symmetrical the whole thing feels. So, be careful on the side here, that actually needs to be cut the other direction, which is counterintuitive. Grain change right there. I don't usually use a potato peeler cut, but in this instance, it kind of feels like the right thing. Very carefully getting to that line. So you can see as I go along here, what you're seeing is that my motions are getting smaller and smaller and more delicate. All right, so now the next step is I'm going to define this rim right here. I'm just going to pull everything up so that it matches that, and that's going to be the underside of the rim. Now remember, I have this goal of creating this sort of lip 
I have no idea how I'm going to do that. I've never done that before. I suspect it's going to be very time consuming. I just want to see what it feels like to carve it, what it feels like to have it there. It's something I want to maybe have on certain spoons. I noticed that that style of lip on um, a metal ladle that my in-laws use when they're boiling down sap. And it got me wondering, was it there simply because it was an easy way to sort of roll over the edge of the metal? Probably. But did it also serve some functional purpose in stopping drips? So that was what I wanted to explore a little bit. Now the goal is not to make the bottom of the bowl perfect at this stage, it's just to reduce some of the weight back here where this connects. You can see it's very strong right there, and I want it to be less strong. Uh, try to carve a spout. Yeah, I didn't leave myself any material to carve a spout with this one. And in general, I'm kind of opposed to spouts because unless you do them on both sides, then it sort of makes it even more sort of uh, one-handed for righties versus lefties and as a lefty I I don't know maybe I feel like I should try and find designs that aren't so dominated by being right-handed um, but yeah I've never tried carving a spout I imagine they're gonna be a little tricky hey well it's okay sweetie To be sure, you know, it's, it's, I'd say actually probably it has very little to do with the fact that it's right handed Greg. It probably has more to do with the idea that I'm not convinced that the spout actually does enough functionally to be worth it. Right? Like without a spout, the liquid will still come over the edge just fine at a given spot. That's the nature of a curved edge. So sort of creating a spout to make it show up at this one spot more sort of feels more like a, like a design conceit that doesn't actually mean anything rather than something that's actually sort of going to make the something function better. Does that make sense? Okay, so you can see how that has now smoothed the weight back there quite a bit. Um, I don't want to do more until I do the inside of the bowl because I want to, again, there's going to be a scallop coming out of the, the front here. Um, so at this stage, I'm going to do the inside of the bowl. I'm going to do just a smidge more here. Just pull it into alignment just a little bit better. And guys, we're coming up probably close to the end of my hour here. We'll see. I might finish this live or I might uh, put on some music and finish it to music. Um, oh, I suppose because there's... Well, I'll have to see how much I care about sharing it with you. Um, because there's this lip, that would be kind of interesting for you guys to see. So, we'll see. All right, so now when I get to this part where I'm carving the bowl, I want to have the center of the bowl swirling down and work my way out from it rather than leave a big lump in the middle. So I'll do 
this over here. And then once I've got the center going down, I'm going to start working my way out and making them narrower and narrower. Um, yeah, I think I'll be able to save this. We'd I, I realized I didn't do a great job of checking to um, make sure I had room on my phone to save it. Um, so I assume, at very least, you'll be able to watch it for the next 24 hours. Um, it's just a matter of whether I do the, the final bit, which will be that creating that rim, whether I do that live or not. Yeah, this is I use I use entirely Matt's knives. That's that's all I use at this point. Let's see how I make it so you guys can see this better. Turn my body a little bit. There we go. Alright, and now as I work my way out, I want to essentially create the rim thickness that I'm looking for. Um, once I get this bowl hauled out a little bit more, I'll go around and I'll work on that rim and get it exactly the way I want it, and then I'll stay away from it for the remainder, the remainder of the carving. Yeah. So here you can see the start of that scallop in the back forming, and that's essentially created by the fact that this handle comes up so steeply that the bowl needs to dig into it. Otherwise, the hook knife can't get to the back of the bowl. Right? So you can see it's getting stronger and stronger. You can see how that helps me get down into the back of the bowl there. I also think it helps create a bit of an organic connection between the handle and the bowl, whereas if the the two were just kind of unrelated to each other, one stuck on the other, it wouldn't be as interesting. But because the bowl bleeds into the handle here, I don't know, it gives it more, more interest to my mind. <laughs> Would it help you, Greg, if I told you it was tough for me doing this? This is, this is hard hollowing, man. So you can see how I'm starting to get a little bit of chatter here. Um, and in part, that's due to the how steeply this is angled across the grain. The steeper it is, the, the quicker you get chatter. But I can get around the chatter by coming at it from a slightly different angle. And thus cleaned up that way. 